One of the major differences between animals and human beings is that humans have the potential to engage in abstract thought. Piaget's theory of cognitive development describes how that potential is actualized. Hello, and welcome to an overview of Piaget's theory of cognitive development. My name is Bill Hewitt, and I'm Professor Emeritus at Valdosta State University and adjunct professor at Capella University. The presentation is narrated by Jeff Hewitt, who is helping me produce these videos. Remember that in the early 20th century, psychology was dominated by two theoretical approaches, the psychodynamic theories of Freud, Adler, and Jung, and the behavioral theories of Watson, Thorndike, and Skinner. During that same period of the early 20th century, Jean Piaget, who lived from 1896 to 1980, developed a theory of human cognitive development that did not become popular until the cognitive revolution of the 1950s and 1960s. Piaget was a remarkable scholar who produced his first published paper on mollusks at the age of 11. He continued to study biology as well as philosophy and earned a PhD at the age of 22. He then went to Paris and taught at a school run by Alfred Binet and worked in his lab where Binet was developing an intelligence test. He became interested in why children of a certain age answered questions incorrectly, but in the same way. Piaget's work in biology, philosophy, psychology, and sociology led to the development of his theory of cognitive development that he labeled genetic epistemology, as he was interested in how biology impacts how human beings come to know themselves and the world around them. In 1943, Piaget supervised Barbell Inhelder's PhD dissertation, and they collaborated on the development of the theory until his death in 1980. Piaget's theory consists of two components. The first is the process by which human beings construct mental representations as they interact with their environments. And the second is a sequence of stages that Piaget hypothesized were invariant across all human beings, regardless of the environments in which they were raised. As stated previously, Piaget labeled his theory genetic epistemology. Central to this theory is the concept of schemes or schema, as they are sometimes called. The difference between the two terms is that scheme refers to a pattern of action, while schema more often refers to a more static concept or image. For example, as infants and children interact with the environment, they form mental images such as tree or field, and when they develop language, they attach labels to those images. At the same time, they develop action patterns such as how to order food at a restaurant. These schemes, or created mental representations, allow them to interact with and adapt to the demands of the environment. This is done using two compatible processes. The first is labeled assimilation. For example, the children might form a schema of a dog as a result of seeing and interacting with one. Later, the child is able to assimilate, or to bring into schema, a wide variety of examples of dogs, although they may differ in multiple characteristics. The second process is labeled accommodation. In this case, the child might see a cat and attach the label dog to it. However, the parent will provide feedback that this is a different animal, labeled cat. The child then creates a new category of cat and begins the process of assimilating other examples of cat into this new scheme. The term Piaget uses for the success of adapting to the environment is equilibration. By this, he means the schemes that have been created allow the individual to achieve equilibrium with the demands of the environment. For example, learning to dress oneself is a relatively complicated task. One has to learn to put on underwear first, then pants and shirt, and finally socks and shoes. Each of these tasks requires a slightly different skill set that must be mastered, and there is a required order for completion. And there are thousands of these mental representations that must be created, some of which must be replaced by better schemes as one grows and develops. Piaget identified four stages that people go through as they move from infancy to adulthood. The first is labeled sensory motor and occurs in infancy. At this stage, the infant is interacting with the environment through sensory and motor activities without the use of language. One of the significant milestones for this stage is the development of object permanence, where the infant understands the objects do not disappear simply because they can no longer be seen. The next stage, which occurs between 18 to 24 months, and about five to seven years old is labeled pre-operational. At this stage, children begin to develop language and use imagination in playful ways. For example, they can imagine that dogs can play cards and that animals can talk. It is not unusual to have an imaginary friend at this age. Piaget hypothesized that all children would begin to move into concrete operational stage beginnings about the time that most children start formal schooling. At this stage, children can engage in logical thinking with concrete objects, especially those that they can manipulate. 
Children slowly attain what Piaget describes as conservations, where a feature of the object has changed, but there is in fact no change. David Elkin, in a video prepared by Davidson Films, provides an excellent short overview of this stage available on YouTube at the URL shown on the screen. In fact, there are a wide variety of YouTube videos that show different aspects of cognitive development at this stage. The fourth stage, according to Piaget, is the formal operational stage in which the individual is able to engage in abstract logical thinking. Whereas in the concrete operational stage, individuals needed to have a concrete reference in order to think logically. In the formal operation stage, the individual is able to engage in the logical manipulation of ideas where there is no immediate concrete reference. Piaget's hypothesis was that human beings would automatically move into and through a stage as they interacted with the environment. While this seems to be true for the sensory motor and pre-operational stages, notice that the data represented in this figure shows that this is not actually the case. While the subjects in this study began to move from the pre-operational stage to the concrete operational stage at ages 5 and 6, notice that about 20% of the sample remain in this stage by age 9 or the beginnings of 4th grade. While these children will likely be classified as special ed learners at this age, it is important to recognize that they are behind their peers in cognitive development and need the same type of instructional activities as 5- and 6-year-old children needed several years earlier. Notice also that, while the vast majority of 11-year-olds have attained some aspect of concrete operations, there are still a significant number who have not achieved all of the conservations identified by Piaget. Again, this is important for teachers to acknowledge as they develop learning activities for their classrooms. Finally, notice that the development of formal operations does not move as quickly as did the development of concrete operations. In fact, less than 25% of adolescents have started or attained formal operations by age 14, three years after Piaget thought they would make the transition. For concrete operations, a comparable number is 75% at age 9. In a comparable study completed a decade later, Notice that about 24% of the sample had started or achieved the transition to formal operations and gained the ability to engage in abstract logical thinking. Unfortunately, this number has only increased to 34% by the time the learners were graduating from high school. The data show emphatically that the environment of traditional schooling is insufficient to provide the vast majority of learners with the demands that will require movement to abstract thinking, even though they may be biologically prepared to do so. While this might not have been an issue when large portions of the workforce were employed in low or moderately skilled manufacturing jobs prevalent in the 19th and 20th centuries, this is especially critical for today's youth as these jobs are moving to Asia and to Africa. The percentage of workers employed in agriculture, mining, and manufacturing in most developed countries today is between 20 and 30 percent, and that number is diminishing rapidly. Instead, the high-paying jobs and career opportunities require the ability to gauge in abstract logical and creative thinking. These are basic prerequisite skills necessary if youth are to take full advantage of the many opportunities that are being created for meaningful work. Some suggestions for how to best use the principles of cognitive development identified by Piaget and how to engage learners at different stages will be the topic of a separate presentation. It should be acknowledged that a number of researchers have developed theories that postulate a fifth stage applicable to adults labeled post-formal operations. The stage focuses on identifying and solving so-called wicked problems that require more than logical analysis to arrive at multiple possible solutions. A discussion of this work is beyond the scope of this brief overview. One of the most prominent authors in this work is Michael Commons, who provides an overview of post-formal operational thought and hypothesizes five substages in its development. He and his colleagues have been investigating this topic since the early 1980s. Another prominent scholar is Gerald Young, who attempted to integrate Piaget in cognitive development and Ericksonian socio-emotional development. He identified five substages of post-formal thinking. This work deserves attention by those working in adult education.